Hello everyone and welcome to Internet Law Review. For today's story, I am doing a follow-up on a previous video and I'm going to cover three problems I do see with grand juries. In my prior video, link below, I reviewed an article discussing Chelsea Manning and grand juries and I discussed why the problems that Chelsea Manning was referring to were, in my view, not problems at all. Does that mean that grand juries are great? Not necessarily. So in this video, I'm going to explore some of the downsides that there are with grand juries so we can have a more well-rounded picture together. Issue number one, grand juries have too much consolidated power. It's not that grand juries can do anything that anyone else can't do. It's that they can do a whole bunch of things that a lot of other people can do. When grand juries fell out of fashion, their powers didn't go away as I explored in the prior video, their powers became more diffuse. They got shared among professional police forces, among prosecuting attorneys, and among courts. And the problem with grand juries is that it consolidates a lot of those powers in the same place, and they have no one to check them. A grand jury process, unlike the process of a petite jury that tries to determine guilt or innocence, is not held before a judge. It is typically 23 average ordinary citizens, just by themselves, no judge, and the only lawyer there is the prosecutor. And they don't need the review from anyone else to do things. So if you're a police officer and you need a search warrant, you need to go ask a judge. If you're a grand jury and you want a search warrant, you just write one because you can. This is one of the things you get to do. So one of the problems is simply that it has too much consolidated power. Problem number two, grand juries are amateurs. One of the advantages of our modern legal system is that we have created new professional systems. We have police force that is professional, we have lawyers that are professional, and we have judges that are professional, by which I mean there are formal educational degrees, there are formal trainings, and there's formal ways to get educated in that field so that you can become good at your job. But grand juries are chosen just like normal juries are. They, a jury notice is sent out and 23 people, give or take, depending on where you are, are called in for jury duty. These are people with no particular knowledge or training, and yet suddenly they're given the power to subpoena witnesses, subpoena documents, and do investigations, things that police, prosecutors, and judges would otherwise have the power to do. For whatever problems that the police may have, and that's not to say that there aren't any, there are many good things about police and the professional systems that we have. When you ask a whole bunch of amateurs to suddenly wield this great amount of power, it can go off the rails. In fact, one of the biggest problems with grand juries is this going off the rails phenomena. Not only can grand juries explore beyond the scope of the present investigation, they can expand the investigation itself. So there have been instances in grand juries where not only are they suddenly calling witnesses and seeking documents that are tangential as best to the present case, the grand jury decides that they want to investigate something completely different. So an example might be a prosecutor comes to them with a complaint against someone that someone's robbed the bank. And as part of their investigation, they uncover bank records, which suggests that there's some sort of financial fraud, and suddenly we're investigating that, and so forth, and so forth, and so on. And so it can just have a potentially unlimited scope, and it can really go bad when citizens without any ed education suddenly try to be amateur detectives or amateur lawyers or amateur judges. Sometimes it does not end well. Fortunately, in our modern legal system, we've created a whole bunch of rules to prevent grand juries from doing this, but still, even with the rules in place, they can expand the scope of inquiries beyond what is relevant to reach the kind of decision they are. And grand juries have been known from time to time to try to have the entire guilt or innocence trial in the grand jury setting, which isn't their role or purpose. So sometimes they go beyond their scope, beyond their mandate, and that is a problem that is mostly due to the fact that it's run by a group of ordinary citizens, amateurs, without any particular education or knowledge. All you have to be to be a juror is 18 and a citizen, citizen of the United States. No particular education required, so, you know, you give this kind of power to this kind of people and you can see where it can go wrong. Problem number three. Grand juries in the state system can be used by the government to help diffuse responsibility. This is not as much a problem in the federal system, and it's probably because under federal law, specifically the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, grand juries are required for so-called infamous cases, which has been translated to be felony cases. So in the federal system, attorneys have to go to grand juries all the time because they don't have any choice. As a result of that, it's a much more professional environment and there's not that, the kind of bias or temptation that there might be otherwise. 
However, states don't have to have grand juries. The United States Supreme Court, when it was deciding incorporation with respect to grand juries, decided incorporation was not something that applied to grand juries. And again, I'll link below to my prior video discussing incorporation so you can learn more about that topic. But long story short, individual states do not have to have grand juries if they don't want to. So why would a state have a grand jury? Well, there are still some purposes to it for perfect, perfectly noble means, but it also has a very ignoble purpose. Namely, it's a place for the government to go to help defuse responsibility. And a good example are all the situations where we've seen where there's been a cop accused of killing an unarmed civilian. So let's suppose that you're a prosecutor who doesn't want to bring a charge against a police officer, perhaps for fully legitimate reasons, or perhaps maybe not so legitimate, depending on your point of view. But you don't want to make that decision yourself. Here on tape, apparently, is a police officer who seems to be killing an unarmed civilian, and the public is outraged. But you don't think that this is a good case to bring, or it's a case for perhaps political reasons you don't want to bring. So you don't want to make the decision not to bring it. You don't want to make the decision to bring it. What can you do? Well, one of the things you can do is you can hold a grand jury and pass the buck off to them and say, well, the grand jury made their decision. There is nothing you can do. But you, and you don't have to make particularly clear that there was a whole lot you could do because in a grand jury, it's only the prosecutor who's there. Again, all we're trying to determine is probable cause. So there's no defense lawyer there because that process will come later. So the only person who's there presenting evidence is the, is the prosecutor, which means the prosecutor gets to choose what kind of evidence they want to present and they can soft pedal their case and they can call witnesses who have evidence contrary, the evidence that would suggest that this person shouldn't be charged. Again, there's no obligation at a grand jury stage to preclude, to provide any sort of uh, exonerating evidence. That's not the point of it because the threshold and standard we're trying to reach is real low. But if you don't want the grand jury to reach the conclusion that a charge should be entered, you can present all the exonerating evidence you want. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. And so when you soft pedal your strong case and you strengthen the weaknesses of your case and the grand jury decides not to give an indictment, you can say, well, the grand jury made their decisions, nothing I can do about it and pass the buck. But even if you do want to bring criminal charges, grand juries can still be used to diffuse blame. And perhaps we're seeing that right now in the Jesse Smollett case. I don't know Illinois law specifically enough to know for sure, but I would suspect Illinois law does not require grand juries for any particular time. Yet the 16 recent felony counts that came, came from a grand jury. So if I'm correct in my assumption that grand juries are not required by Illinois law, but they still used a grand jury, why would that be true? And the answer would be again to diffuse blame. This is a highly tense situation. There's a lot of racial tension in the air, in the air and uh, Chicago is a city with a heavy minority population. So there might be a lot of people who don't want charges to be brought for a whole bunch of uh, reasons that may not be legitimate from the law, but may be legitimate from a historical point of view. So perhaps the population of your town is not particularly thrilled with the idea of bringing criminal charges in this case, despite the fact that it, it, was, it does appear to be a crime and the evidence does appear to be strong and it does appear to be a violation of the law. Maybe for political reasons, the town would prefer you not bring criminal charges. So the law suggests you should bring criminal charges. The politics say you shouldn't. So what's one thing you can do? And you can pass the, grand, the buck off to the grand jury. You go to the grand jury and you make your strongest case possible. So you're doing exactly what you should be doing at the grand jury, but you get them to issue the indictment. So you can say again, well, it was the grand jury who issued the indictments. I'm just a lowly public servant. There's nothing I could do about it. And you don't have to make particularly clear that there was a whole lot you could have done about it. And again, it's a way to diffuse blame. So those three reasons, along with general inefficiency, is the reason that grand juries are used very seldom in the world today. In fact, there's only two countries in the world that use grand juries at all, Liberia and the United States. And as I mentioned, the United States federal government is forced to use them, but states are not. And most states do not use grand juries, except in the very rarest of situations. I won't go so far as to saying that there's no legitimate use of a grand jury at a state level because there can be legitimate uses of grand juries at a state level. But as I've hopefully illustrated, there is also a temptation to use them for perhaps political purposes of, of passing the buck and diffusing responsibility. So those three reasons combined, I think are valid criticisms of grand jury and are the reasons that grand juries are not used by most states or most of the world today. For now, my friends, that is all. I hope you're well. Until later, cheers and goodbye.